I'd been in Melbourne after the 1990 grand final. Glenelg Port Adelaide beat us by 15 points. Two days in Melbourne, semi-professional at the time, and came back Thursday night and pretty much made up my mind I was going to go after two years of senior footy here. Met with Neil Curley, Bob Hammond, Ed Betro in the Glenelg Football Club boardroom at 10 o'clock. Walked out of there at 3.30, signed with Adelaide, so. Amazing. Yeah. Well, just before I introduce today's guest, a big shout out to Pete Oldfield and the Southern Slugs for sponsoring this episode. They've got a wonderful trip happening in December over there in Phuket in Thailand for those interested in playing some over 35s footy. Get involved in that. Head over to the Southern Slugs Facebook page for more information. But it is time to introduce my guest for today. He's played 153 games for the Adelaide Crows, part of the Adelaide Premiership side in 1997, and of course, the leading goal kicker in their very first year in 1991, Rod Jamo Jamison. Great to have you on the show. Bebo, thank you. Since your footy career, you spent 23 years with the ABC, still on radio, now doing a wonderful job. How do you see footy nowadays? Because there's obviously a lot of talk. Of, you know, Rowie came out the other day and said, it used to be the greatest game of all time, and it's no longer that. And so much talk about the game becoming too soft. And I understand that they're trying to make it a bit better because of all the concussion issues and what have you, which is yep. great. But uh, what's your, your take on it, Jamo? Do you feel as though they've gone too far with we're trying to protect the head and in that now the game's become, because of that sort of cost the game a little bit as well with the way it is? Or It's going to be the biggest challenge for the AFL and the game going ahead. I mean, certainly with 200, what's 300, I think, past players that are putting together big case. And then from this particular point, that's all past players, you know, like what's going to happen going forward the, the challenge really is how do you measure and with that, where does it start? You know, like junior grades, like you're yeah, so a young game, you can't tackle, you can't hip and shoulder and then you sort of get under 12s, under 15s and you can start to implement all that. So it's not necessarily just concussion, it's, it's more around nerves and spines, so the, the damage that that then causes. So what's the impact, how much impact and then if you get to that elite level, I guess you're going to sign some sort of waiver to say, I understand what I could expose myself to here. And then, look, you have to protect the head. I'm super comfortable with that, Bevo. But, you know, you've seen this week just a couple of, you know, MRO decisions and ultimately three, four hours and then they get thrown out. Or, you know, if I'm going for a ball to spin, defend and unfortunately or an accidental you know I knock someone how are you going to stop that so I, it's an enormous challenge for the game and I think it'll be the biggest challenge that the game will have if not already now in the years ahead as to how they're going to navigate through yeah it's, it's a really good point you raise and I certainly want to get a concussion specialist one one time as well on the show to just hear about it from their perspective but yeah. you're, you're right because it's such a great game and and but at the same time and, and you want to keep it competitive you want, and it's a physical game but then you also want to you know rule out the concussion situation as well so yeah. you're right it is a tr it's one of those things that the afl have to look at seriously going forward because you want to keep the game great and as it is but then you've also got to look at how to protect people that are playing it so yeah. it is really tough and yeah it's well, I think the NFL, from what I'm led to believe and what I've read and what I've been engaged with through our past players and officials is that, you know, this has been in place over there for since 2006, 2007. You know, I think the push over here is that's two weeks out of the game once you are or you receive a concussion in a game and those are the protocols, but they want to extend it out to 30 days is where they want to get it. And then there has to be a measurement of... When you come to the competition, there is a measurement of your brain. If you receive a concussion, measurement again. And then at the end of the season, whether you are concussed or not, let's measure it again. So there's this standardized measurement system that is agreed upon with the league, past players, AFLPA. And then if there is any deterioration along the way, but then you bring in do you drink? What else do you do? You know, like, yeah. so what other impact does that then have? So this is where I feel it's, it's, it, this is going to get super big if it's not already as to how to deal with it, how to measure it. And then I guess from today backwards, how are we going to help and support the past players that have been through it that are having these symptoms and issues, let alone what it's going to look like going forward? 
Yeah, 100%. And also the other thing is 30 days, what happens if it's a grand final? And and say, for example, like let's look at Geelong and Jeremy Cameron gets concussed yeah. and, and it happens in the finals yeah. and there's a rule that, okay, you can't play for 30 days. That means he misses a grand final. Yeah. What would happen then? Yeah. And, and that's a real possibility. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I mean, you get, geez, get concussed a couple of times. I mean, there's two thirds of the season gone. But in saying it, you have to, we don't know the outcome, you know, yeah. like, and we don't live with each other. So some of the people that are putting their hands up and maybe have these symptoms of early dementia or depression, anxiety, um, you don't know that until you're actually living with someone to see how they've deteriorated. And I think the one at the moment um, for me is, I guess, Liam Pickham, who yeah. was so great for the Western Bulldogs, part of their premiership team. He's now looking or he is suing the club but particularly the doctor as well as part of that because when he got concussed he's saying the doctor didn't tell him he shouldn't be playing he just assessed him and said you are ready to go after the protocols and then he went back to play as opposed to you should have told me at a certain point i've been concussed x amount of times that i should not be playing anymore so it's enormously litigious and again i, I think it's going to be the biggest challenge for the game moving forward it's going to be very interesting going forward, like you said before, just to see what happens. And yeah. Yeah, they're certainly trying to do their best, aren't they? So, yeah, 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 totally. Now, this year, obviously, the Adelaide Crows are playing some very nice footy at the moment. Last couple of years has been a bit rough for the side. Uh, where do you see the improvement so far and have you seen it as a bit of a surprise, the way they're going? Oh, but probably not a surprise. I think um, Matty Nix is a really good contemporary connected coach too and I think we've got a really good group of coaches around him too with great experience from multiple clubs and I guess the youth of the group that's coming through now, you know, you're starting to see him reach that 40, 50, 60 game milestone with the, I guess the other players that are more senior, Rory Sloan, Tex Walker, Brody Smith, those guys that have been around for a while, Rory Laird. Certainly defence has been really strong this year. And even the disposal will be in the last couple of weeks. They've possibly could have won games if they had have finished better. But you know, certainly the way they move the football, slow it down, but their they're kicking and maintaining possession is something in the last 12 to 18 months that's improved enormously. And if you watch them too, probably 18 months ago, they'd look. And if they didn't kick it then, it's an opportunity to hit it. Um, then they go back and go down the line. So it's just easy to, to set up and then, I guess, attack from that way. So there's a couple of areas that they've really improved and, you know, they're certainly heading in the right direction. Looking at the side as well, obviously, adding Rankin to the Crows list this year. And I've been really impressed as well with a couple of players who've almost gone under the radar a little bit, coming back from injury, and that's uh, Wayne Miller and also Rory Sloan. Yeah. It's almost like having two extra new recruits, isn't it, the way they're going about it? And obviously Jordan Dawson's such a good ball user as well. Yeah, and look, the other player that I probably doesn't get the praise, Lockie Murphy is a really solid defensive player up forward too, so adding him in there, he goes at the footy, gets it, tackles hard. Uh, Miller, yep, certainly had the 12 months off, so almost like a new recruit as well. Brody Smith probably had a quieter year last year. So when you have a look at the the key posts in Murray and Butts as well, and they've really held down and, and they're sort of achieving that 50 game milestone and the cohesion together. Tommy Dude, um, you know, had a, a shoulder operation over the summer too, so probably isn't at his best, but you know, they continue to improve. Parnell's going okay, Chase Jones off the half back line. So they've got the ability now to sort of swing them through half back and through the middle or push the high half forwards up to be able to get behind the footy on top of that executing well. And um, yeah, there's a couple of players that are probably playing pretty good footy. Yeah, I think the, to me personally, like it was tough being there as a Port fan, but watching that showdown and, and that last quarter as well, do you feel as though that sort of gave them belief that they're actually, you know, they're up and about this year as well, you know, knowing that they're beating a really good side in Port? I, like obviously last year Port had a disappointing season, but uh, knowing that your Port's going to be up there again this year with that win against Brisbane Lions in round one? Yeah, no, I, I think it was important for Adelaide to win that one. And any showdown is important, isn't it, either way? They're always tough games, but particularly the way they finished off against, you know, everyone was, and I was the same. I, I still think Port are a really good side. To be able to finish off and kick the last six without them scoring and really finish off the game, that's something that years gone by, we haven't seen Adelaide do that for the last three or four years. So to be able to then stick fat through the Hawthorne game as well, but then GWS, Richmond, the Collingwood one, you know, these games, if they just execute in different parts of the game, who knows what the result could have been different too. So Geelong had opportunities 
late in the game still to stay in it, but also win it, but didn't execute again. And it goes back the other way. So um, it's a big test from coming against St Kilda. Yeah, most, and obviously that, that's a learning curve, isn't it, as well, just yeah. to how to finish off the, the games, like you said, the Geelongs and, yeah. and the week before against Collingwood, which they should have won. But uh, yeah. I think I spoke on radio about that to Mark Ace the other day. It, the best sides are the ones that finish those games. The, the good sides are the ones that, that don't, if that makes sense. And, yeah. you know, to, to be that best side, you've got to win those games against Collingwood and Geelongs, don't you? And, yeah. and that's why I guess what's stopping the Crows from being uh, that, that good side to that ne next step of being that really good top four side, isn't it? So, well, I think everyone refers to 2017, Bevo. I think it's the, you know, certainly with my role through the radio and calling the games, it's the first, in 2017, I just felt Adelaide were going to win every game. And I'd never felt that before, even when we were playing. So the reference back to that, I don't think we're just there yet in terms of where we are, but it's certainly on the improve. So when the game starts to get tight, they can control it. They maintain possession. They know when to go really hard. You just can't allow the opposition to get a, a big break, centre clearances, three, four, five, six goals. It's always hard to get it back to that. And then you've got to sustain and then get in front. And I don't think they're far off it. So we've got a couple of tough weeks ahead and that'll that'll test Adelaide. So we'll get a bit of picture there. And let's go back to your career. Obviously, yeah. I spoke <laughs> about it. You were part of the inaugural squad with the Adelaide Crows. What was it like, firstly, you know, getting your name called and knowing that you were going to be part of what they call the Pride of South Australia? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. It was um, uh, humbly. Well, I was drafted at the end of 89 to the Kangaroos. So through that time frame where it was different now when you got drafted so you, you got called out and you had a three-year period where you could either stay or go and if that three-year term expired you just go back into the market you weren't there like you are today your name gets called out you sign the agreement either today or tomorrow you're in that market playing for that club or training with that club so when Adelaide came into the competition I was lucky enough to be one of the 10 concessions so I'd been in Melbourne after the 1990 grand final Glenelg Port Adelaide beat us by 15 points, two days in Melbourne, semi-professional at the time, and came back Thursday night and pretty much made up my mind I was going to go after two years of senior footy here. Met with Neil Curley, Bob Hammond, Ed Betro in the Glenelg Football Club boardroom at 10 o'clock, walked out of there at 3.30, signed with Adelaide. So Amazing. Yeah. And at that time, one of 85 that turned up for training and we went through and I guess players over time either fell away or got eliminated down to the squad and, yeah, lucky enough to be a part of the inaugural team. Was there thoughts of staying on at the Kangaroos as well? Yeah, look, I, I'd pretty much come back Thursday night going, I'm, I'm gone because no one really knew at that time either. I was only informed on the, the Monday through Ed Betro that, hey, look, there's Adelaide is forming a side and we'd love the opportunity to have a chat to you. So out of respect with the names that were going to meet with me, I thought, absolutely, I'll come and meet and have a chat. I, I guess in my wildest dreams, I didn't think that I was going to sign with Adelaide or certainly walk out of there that day and, and be an Adelaide player. That's amazing, isn't it? And, and a story that not many people would know about as well, about yourself nearly playing with the kangaroos. Yeah. Um, and let's go back to again, back to 1991, because yep. you're obviously there when the famous fire walking incident with Nodge was fun. <laughs> Tell us about that night and how that all came about and, and the feeling from everyone and afterwards as well. It must be some serious banter, no doubt. Yeah, look, it was fun. I mean, we had a, a camp at Rapid Bay and I guess you reflect now, I mean, they were really tough, long days, um, physically tough, mentally challenging. And unbeknownst to us, um, I've known Nigel since I was 13, we've played football cricket against each other and, and with each other. Nigel's always out there and always sort of thinking laterally. And um, we turned up, we're in the hall, and they said, right, this is what we're going to do. They introduced a gentleman. His name was Paul Blackburn. And he took us up onto the hill, and here was this fire that was about 20, 30 foot in the air, and we couldn't get within 30 metres of it. I said, right, we're going to be walking across that later. So we go back down into the hall, we prepare for two to three hours, more so to challenge your own mind as to what you can accomplish. We go back up there and they'd flatten it down. It was just like an eight to 10 metre runway of, of hot coals. And you had a player either side of you that was to guide you through so you could concentrate and focus on what you had to do. And I think for memory, Nigel had Anthony Ingerson and Sean Tasker on either side. So Nigel's up there ready to go first because he wanted to. We, we implemented it and we, he suggested we should do it. And I, I recall, you know, he's going cold sand, cold sand, cold sand and got about three quarters of the way through and I think Sean Tasker said, geez, that's hot. 
and of course it broke his concentration. He sort of hopped around and got through it. But it was, I mean, he did it three days later. He was wearing footy boots and back to training. So the photos that were taken were actually, and they looked nasty, but it wasn't that bad. And Paul Blackburn just went right, and he just did it straight after. But because of Niger's feet, the club just went, nah, with no one else to do it. So we didn't have to do it after that. But um, I think pretty much all of us were prepared to give it a go. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I oh know. <laughs> Trying to get away with it now. Like Western Bulldogs jumping out of a plane into the middle of the bay in Melbourne, oh. parachuting and bungee jumping and all those types of things. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, we won't talk about the Crows camp because that's been spoken about way too many times down oh. the track. So, yeah, yeah, let that one go under, under the carpet, I think. Uh, yeah, and again, that same same year, 1991, that win against Hawthorne in your, your very first game at Footy Park, yeah. was that a bit of a surprise as well, considering how well the Hawks have been going those years previous and, and knowing that, you know, they were the outright favourites and you were just the new kids on the block as yeah. well. Well, I was originally, oh, well, I'm originally from Victoria, came over here when I was 11 and I was a Hawthorne supporter growing up. So half the team, two thirds of it, I'd actually followed, you know, as a youngster, um, the opportunity to play against them, knowing who they were, how they were, it was a, an honour, one to pull on the Adelaide jumper to, to play against my childhood heroes too. And at the time, there was, I think, two on the bench and you didn't rotate as much as what you do today. And I didn't come on until um, Chris McDermott got knocked out by Dermot Brereton and Paul Deere, came on and played, I think it was a quarter and a, a, a bit, but my first kick was I tackled John Kennedy and got him holding the ball and I almost wanted to help him back up, you know. Like, um, but it was amazing in terms of how we performed. Um, coming from Glenelg, David Marshall, we share the same birthday, 10 years apart, but he was an amazing player, totally committed at the age, but also incredibly skilled and talented. And he had a, a tremendous night out. And you just sort of think how someone of his talent went through his career at Glenelg and never really got picked up by an AFL club, but Bruce Linder coming back, Tony McGuinness coming back, Tom Warhurst, um, Bruce Linder. Like, it was just great to be able to play with these guys. Probably the one I, I would have loved. I mean, Andrew Jarman played. I would have loved to have played, you know, with Gary McIntosh, if he, oh. you know, it would have been. But um, that was, I understand the reasons why he stayed at Norwood. But, um, yeah, it was a pretty surreal moment, and then away we went. And in that year, obviously you were the leading goal kicker as well. That must have been pretty special to know you've done that in the very first year of the club. Yeah, it was. It was um, sort of played more halfback midfield for Glenelg and then came in and I think Scott Hodges got injured and then I sort of played more forward. And we had a reasonable year. I remember Bob Hammond, the, the chairman at the time, coming in the last game we played the Kangaroos and yeah, how important it was for corporate sponsorship, you know, and finish off the year as we hoped we would, which we did. So we... We belted the kangaroos that night. I kicked eight goal five and ended up with 49 goals. So it was, um, it was a, the cap off the year that way was pretty solid. And that sort of, I guess, 92, we struggled a little bit. Then 93, we, we started to go okay again. Do you feel as though, you know, knowing that you kicked those 49 goals in, in 1991, that forward was your, your favourite position or, or it was hard to say, you know, because you played all over, you're a bit of a versatile player, Jamo. Yeah, well, I... I I think I just sort of filled a role at the time and, um, yeah, I probably, I mean, I'd had a couple of years at Glenelg with under Graham as well, but I never really played forward. It was more sort of midfield and then half back um, and on the wing. So, no, to go forward, Bevo was a, you know, it was happy to up there. Look, I had some, we had some talent that could deliver it okay and, um yeah, I, I didn't think I was going to stay there long, and particularly when Tony Modra came along. Oh, yes. I wasn't staying there long at all. <laughs> we'll talk about him a little, little bit later on, but yeah. uh, I just want to play some vision. 44 seconds remaining. Right. And the They've got to get a goal. They've got to get a goal. Well, he's a long, long way out. He just kicks over the centre. They need a he's mark. Hold. Another free kick. Oh, Another come free on. kick. He was held initially. Ah. Oh. 30 seconds remaining. Jarman, he's got to go long. He wants to go going? out there. He's gone to Paul Ruse, who couldn't take the mark. But Ruse tries to bottle it up. Now, boys, get a hold of the ball. Oh, 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 this is murder. Oh. Absolute murder. No, it's on, Peter. Oh, there they all come on. 
Jamison is going to take the ball. He's if, kicked two goals. If they win this game, it's been pinched. Absolutely stolen by... Uh, well, it's going to be the last kick of the day. This is going to be the last kick. But watch this. Watch this on replay. Look at that. He's tried to make an effort. But Jamison oh, is... A, I'll tell you what. Might have been for throw. They've got the best guy having the kick. He is a great kick. Is he going the torpedo punt? No. The siren has gone. The siren has gone. This kick, if it's a goal, will win the match for the Crows from 47 metres. It'll make the distance. Oh, he's kicked it. They've stolen it. It's a goal. Absolute murder. Absolute murder. Unbelievable finish. Oh. Well, the Crows supporters are absolutely jubilant. And you are absolutely no, stunned. I am stunned. Now, this must bring back some memories, Jamo. 991 against Fitzroy, kicking that winner after the siren in what was like pretty torrentious conditions as well, and to kick it from nearly 50 metres out. And that must have been a pretty amazing feeling knowing you kicked the winner as well there. Yeah, I remember the date, 9th of June, 1991. My birthday is the 30th of June. And at the time, the competition was starting to play Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday games. So just from a distance out, um, we had some commitments, so I thought, let's just do it on the 9th of June. And then the night unfolded like it was, and we were only in our infancy as a club. And so I'd had 80-odd people organised to come to my 21st at the Glenelg Cricket Club. That unfolded like that on that night. I had over 200 turn up and six Fitzroy blokes turned up as well. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty unique night. Yeah, no, I loved how it unfolded and to, to finish off like it did. So, And how'd you do it as well? Because like I said before, it's um, pretty damn hard kicking, kicking a waterlogged ball at the best of times, but especially from so far out. Did you, did you think about going for a talk as well? <laughs> talk us through it. Yeah, no, I, I think at the time, I like I was a big fan of Peter Motley too, like when I, and just the way he held the footy. And I look, I've just sort of, you watch closely on players that use the football well and... Um, so it was, I, I don't think I really thought too much about the distance. I felt I could get there. I didn't think about the magnitude of the kick and post siren either too. It was just one, maybe if I was a bit older, possibly, but just being a little bit younger at the time, I just thought I'd just go back and kick the kick. And I didn't think what would happen if I did or if I, if I didn't. But yeah, uh, John Iron Munger was on the line. Managed to get over his head, and then yeah, it was a, a pretty good night after that. Living every childhood dream, hey? Yeah, yeah. I know. Hey? Well, there's not too many. I think it's up over. It's about mid forties, I think now in the entire competition, the history of the VFL AFL that have kicked a goal after after the sirens. So yeah, pretty yeah, humble. pretty rare. Yeah, not many as well. For sure, yeah. part of a pretty illustrious club there, Jamo. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and obviously 1997. You were part of the, the Premiership's winning side there with the Adelaide Crows. Um, yep. What was that feeling when that siren went? And, and tell us about the aftermatch celebrations. Who were the best on ground there? Oh, the year itself, it didn't start off as we hoped. And then, of course, we played Port Adelaide in the showdown. And, yeah, Malcolm Bloat, we just walked into the room in the auditorium and he just wrote number 18 on the board and said, look, there's 18 games to go. And from that point, it really probably kick-started our season. And I think what... I loved and we loved about how bloody went about it. He just simplified everything, like played in the back line in that particular year. And I did go forward for a little bit in 98 as well, but he was quite happy to sort of mix it up and throw things around. As a back line, we would just go, he said, right, you go out and match up on who you feel is best. And if I don't like it, I'll send the runner out and we'll make a change. So <laughs> just the autonomy to be able to play accordingly, kept it really simple. Um, and probably around that time, um, you know, Shane Allen, Nigel Smart, Ben Hart, Tyson Edwards, Andrew McLeod, Peter Caven, we sort of tended to rebound off the half back and really started to drive the attacks from back there. And, you know, so when we got to the grand final, it was, um, I wouldn't say surreal, but it was, I think we all went in with a fair bit of comfort that, you know, we've been able to get this far. Why can't we go further again? And I, I remember on the morning there was Aussie Jones and I think I can't recall the other player was. They were on TV having breakfast, you know, like pre-game. And then when we lined up from the national anthem, they just all put their arms around each other and we all just went, oh, gee, yeah, this is going to be a tough day. And it all, yeah, came together. And, of course, Darren Jarman, Kane Johnson just had monster days. Andrew McLeod did. And, um, yeah, it was great. 
from that night, Bevo, I, I, we went to the tennis centre, back to the casino for dinner, and I was with Tyson Edwards and Ben Hart, and we're just about to go up this escalator, and a gentleman put his arm on my shoulder, and he just said, congratulations, I know how you feel, Wayne Harms <gasps> from Carlton, the greater Carlton. So I called the boys back down, and we had a chat for a bit, and yeah, we, we celebrated long and hard. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. So you won't go too much into detail about who, uh, who the best, best on ground were? Or? Oh, look, there would have been. There was quite a few. Um, <laughs> it was a wonderful time to spend together when you reflect on just celebrating and enjoying what we'd accomplished and achieved. So, but I recall, I think I had three beer-free days in five weeks. So oh, <laughs> it was pretty solid. <laughs> yeah, I can just imagine. Yeah. yeah, no doubt Darren Jarman would have led the celebrations, I can imagine as well. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, FUD was pretty good. 98, he actually missed the parade because he had a reasonably solid night the night before too. So he, <laughs> I think he fell asleep in the garden. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was surprising one bit. Yep. Yep. And speaking of characters, you mentioned before Malcolm Blight, and I've heard some absolute classic stories about when he was, you know, coaching the cats and he turned the lights off. I think they were losing against the Crows, ironically, at Footy Park one, one night and turned the lights off and just absolutely gave him a spray at half time. And, you know, just sort of fill us in some of the, the blighty antics as well yeah. over the years as coach. Well, I remember that one. I think, um, I think Billy Brownless tells the story that <clears throat> he turned off the lights. I mean, and, and, they're only in a small room at the time before we moved over to where our home um, facilities are now. And he, apparently he started just throwing his fists around. So all the guys <laughs> in Geelong were covering up. But there was one night I, I think he – I remember running out onto Football Park and he'd had Geelong line up like a guard of honour um, as we ran out onto the ground. And that was a bit bizarre. It didn't work for him. I think we belted him by about 16 goals that night too. So – yeah, but I mean, Blighty had his way and I, probably the other one, I remember in 98, he walked off the ground with John Reed. Yes, I remember that. Halfway through the last quarter. <laughs> yeah. So we were up against Richmond and I'd only just returned. Um, and a couple of weeks prior, we'd organised to have a one-on-one -on -one as he did, as he worked his way through the rest of the team. And I kicked five that day. We ended up losing by a couple of goals. And I walked in and uh, just in his mannerisms, how he was, he, oh, five goals, was it? They're all pretty soft, weren't they? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the meeting didn't go that long, but yeah, he was pretty unique with some of his approaches, but um, he certainly got the best out of most, if not all. I had an absolute pleasure of working with him for a couple of months back in the day, and yeah, he's he's very different away from uh, away from being a coach. I think so. Yeah. A lot more relaxed these days. <laughs> Loves a red wine yes. and his golf. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of other characters as well, you you spoke about Jars. Um, who are some of the other real characters that you played with throughout your career, whether it be at the Bays or whether it was with the Crows as well, Jamo? Yeah. Well, certainly, both Jam and boys are always a bit of fun to be around too. Um, Andrew with his antics, but you know, I think not only could they do that on field but off field, but they just backed that up with the way that they played their footy too. Um, Peter Vardy was always a bit of a, a prankster and um, referred to as the mad bomber. I remember he was having a, a bit of a purple patch at one particular point and uh, he didn't feel that he was going to be around much longer. So hence the name. He said, look, if they're not going to remember, I'll just blow this joint up, then they'll remember me. So that's how he got the Mad Bomber. Um, <laughs> what did he actually do? <laughs> well, he didn't do anything. He was just, I think he was struggling with injuries. His body was letting him down at the time. So, yeah, look, Mods um, just around, he didn't really train a lot. He just had this unbelievable talent and he was pretty active through surfing. So he was always big and strong. I think most you could sort of tell a story about some of the characters. <laughs> Ian Perry was always a bit of a character. I mean, when he came to the club, um, you know, you, you get your ankles strapped. And I remember I was sitting in front of my locker and he was down the other end and I turned around and he had this big hunting knife and he was cutting his tape off that. And I remember <laughs> turning, I think, to Ben Hart and I said, I don't know how much we can help this bloke. You know? <laughs> Instead of just grabbing scissors and cutting it off. So oh, we, we were... Pretty blessed, Bevo, too, with the, the group of guys that, you know, we played with. 
through my time, nearly 10 years at the footy club, you know, we had some great people and really good characters. Were there any other sort of pranks that you were, you saw as, as part of the, your time at the Adelaide Crows well you want to share? Uh, it's probably, I, I guess as we became more professional, the pranks were there, but they were probably just silly things that would happen to just make you laugh and giggle. And um, I do recall in my Glenelg days when I first came to the club, uh, I had a, my first car was a, a Kingswood, like a HQ Holden. And I don't know how they found out, but somehow any Holden key would fit my car. So then once the players realized that, they took great pleasure in just jumping in my car at training and after games and going and parking it somewhere or driving it somewhere. So I'd come out and my car's gone. So, yeah. So. My friends used to do that to me as well. I had one of those old school Ford lasers and the same thing, you could break into it with a paddle pop stick. And every night after basketball, whether it be playing or umpiring, I'd find my car parts miles away. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, those rat bags. But no. it gives you a good laugh, doesn't it? It does, so, indeed. And obviously, you played with some absolute greats, you know, mods, jars, but. To, if you had to say your top three that you played with, who would they be, Gemma? Look, I had great admiration for Chris McDermott coming from Glenelg to see him lead there and then watch state games into what he did at Adelaide. Um, I mean, in terms of setting our club up, Tony McGuinness as well, um, you know, played with Bruce Lindsay, played against him when he was at the Eagles and then played with him too. Um, look, there were many players, I mean, see Kane Johnson come in, then unfortunately went back home, but then to go and Captain Richmond, Simon Goodwin, you know, coming in and performing and and now look where he is, you know, coaching Melbourne and he's taken from where they are and he's done a significant apprenticeship too. I was always a big fan of Brett James, the way he performed and played, Shane Allen, you know, what he was able to accomplish. Um, Tyson Edwards, Ben Hart for longevity and over 300 games, Mercurial, Andrew McLeod, mods with what he would do that was just insane Bevo, oh. the way he would perform and play and especially what you said before with like minimal training as well that's just phenomenal yeah well <laughs> he, he wasn't the hardest worker and um, <laughs> in the end it was probably got the better of him and unfortunately he ended up missing 97 through his knee and then came back in 98 and they had a bit of a blow up and um he walked in and moved he was moved on to Fremantle and spent a few seasons over there and and albeit had the ability, the anonymity to be able to move away from Adelaide where the media focus wasn't on him, um, played for Freer, but still did some tremendous work over there and is now a life member of the LA Football Club and are back around doing a lot of things. So, yeah, pretty lucky. And in terms of your toughest opponent, who have they been, Jamal and why? Jason Dunstall stood him many a time, big, strong, fast, and then you had the elite talent of Hawthorne delivering it to him. Stood Gary Ablett a few times, never really said much. And he was a freak. Standing in front of him, he'd sit on your head, you know, behind him, he was quick and big and strong. Um, we were playing f at Footy Park one day and it was traditionally where you'd, you'd just line up and you'd have that bloke in the middle of your 50 and just stand out the front. And Chris McDermott happened to be that bloke. And just about to kick off and Gary Ablett's yelling out, McDermott, McDermott. And Bone didn't turn around. He, but damn it. Bone turned around and Gary just went, wouldn't stand there if I was you. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Lockett stood him several times. Um, oh, what a beast. Busted my collarbone <laughs> in 98, missed seven weeks, the first seven rounds at a trial game. So decided <laughs> to dump me into the ground. And Stephen Kernahan was another one who was a coach of mine when I was at Glenelg, under 13s, 14s, 15s. We all had senior players and um, didn't get to play with him at Glenelg. And obviously then I stood him when he went to Carlton. So I was lucky enough to stand a, a number of the greats of the game through our time. Well, Rod Jamo Jamison, thanks for coming on Sports Legends of Bevo today, mate. No, uh, pleasure, thank you. Enjoyed it, good to catch up. Yeah, likewise, and uh, awesome to hear about your amazing career as well, and uh, all the best going forward with yourself and your family and, and everything at the ABC too. Yeah, likewise, with your young family. Oh, all the best. You. Thank you. All right, Bevo, thank you. <laughs>